thank you for tonight, Lord. We thank you for bringing us here. We, we're so thankful for the time and the minutes we have to be here tonight to worship you and to lift our voices. And how freeing that is to be able to worship here in a country that has not yet really been persecuted, to still have this freedom to meet uh, with no issues, Lord. And we're so grateful to, to have this time, Lord, and we want to use it. We don't want to squander it. We don't want to waste it. We want to dive deep into your word with, with the time that we have. The time that we have is the church globally. We want to know more about you before uh, these books are ripped from our grip. Or we want to take in as much as we can before that day comes. And so Lord, we do just pray for your blessing upon this word as it goes forth tonight. And would you speak to our hearts? In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So again, Genesis chapter 28 tonight. If you recall, it was back in Genesis chapter 27, where we began to see just a lot of corruption. We, you know, we had this supposed godly family on the scene. Isaac, Rebecca, uh, Jacob, and Esau, and they were doing everything wrong. Right? It was back in Genesis chapter 25 that God was, was foretelling and he was prophesying that the older Esau shall serve the younger Jacob. As in that the blessing of God should be passed down from Isaac unto Jacob instead of Esau. And even with that knowledge, that this man who was once so consecrated to the Lord, Isaac, began to rebel against God's purposes and God's plan. He decided to go in his own direction. He said, no, 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 God. Uh, the blessing is going to go upon Esau, not, not on Jacob. 
And then you had Rebecca, his own wife, going behind his back with it, scheming him, right? Undermining his own plan. And then under them, they had Jacob. Jacob was listening to his mother, Rebecca to deceive their own father. And then you had Esau, who throughout this entire story of going through the life of Jacob and Esau, Esau's just been so carnal, carnally minded. He's not, he's not spiritually aware of anything. He has no spiritual interest in the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And so, essentially, we have the average, typical, dysfunctional American family on the scene. Um, but, you know, in the midst of this carnal chaos, God's will be done. Right? Because our preferences, our feelings, our ideas never take precedent over God's will and God's purposes and God's plan. So nonetheless, just as God said what happened back in Genesis 25, we, we saw it happen. The blessing was put upon Jacob. And, and with that happening, you know, we ended up seeing Esau now hate Jacob for that. And he began to, to develop uh, murder in his heart. He wanted to kill his brother. And so now Jacob is put into this position where he needs to flee. For refuge, he wants to go to Uncle Laban's house. At least that was his mother's idea. And but before he goes to Uncle Laban's house, his mother has one concern. She says, "Boy, listen to me. You're not going to marry a heathen." And then she expresses this concern to Isaac, the father. And that that brings us to Genesis chapter 28. He's going to sit Jacob down and say, "Boy, don't go out and marry a heathen." So again, if you would pick up with me in Genesis chapter 28, verse one. The scriptures say that Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and charged him and said to him, you shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. And again, he never said this to Esau. He's only saying this to Jacob. Verse 2, arise, go to Padan Aram, to the house of Bethuel, your mother's father, and take yourself a wife from there of the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. So here we have now Isaac stepping up to the plate, actually fulfilling the father role. And he challenges his son to not marry an unbeliever because he knows the position, the blessing that has just been bestowed upon Jacob. It's honorable. He is now going to be the next patriarch of the family, and he's going to stand at the direct line that leads to Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And so we have all of this going on. And evidently at this point in time, you know, it's interesting because his whole character seems to have been changing from the previous chapter. He was a man who was once rebelling against the purpose of God, but now he's aligning himself with what God would have. And I'm sure at this point in time, Isaac's remembering, of his, uh, remembering his former days, thinking about when his own father, Abraham, told his servant to go out and get Isaac a wife. And then the servant brought back to Isaac... Rebecca, who was a godly woman, and at that point, Isaac was like, wow, God truly is in control of this. God knows what he's doing. So now he's encouraging his own son, saying, listen, son, you need to do this God's way so that this lineage and this blessing of God can be preserved. And so at this point, Isaac now knows that the patriarchal blessing truly does belong to Jacob instead of Esau. And as we go into verse 3, you see that now Isaac is bestowing uh, the greater portion of this blessing upon his son. It says in verse 3, May God Almighty, may, may El Shaddai bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you, that you may be an assembly of peoples and give you the blessing of Abraham to you and your descendants with you, that you may inherit the land in which you are a stranger, which God gave to Abraham. Verse 5, so Isaac sent Jacob away, and he went to Padam Aram, to Laban, the son of Bethuel the Syrian, the brother of Rebekah, the mother of Jacob and Esau. And I, I, do, I truly find it so astonishing and interesting that, again, one chapter ago, Isaac was this carnal man. But now he, he's stepping into the spirit. And he's bestowing this profound blessing upon his son. And essentially what Isaac's doing here, he's saying, listen, Jacob, the two most important decisions of your life is marriage and worship. No doubt who we marry and who we worship make all the difference in our lives. And men, who you marry is going to become your ministry. And they're going to assist you in your ministry. And ladies, who you marry, it's going to become the one who leads your home. And that's why this is such a crucial and an important decision in our lives. So with, first we have marriage. You know, one of, my, one of my pastors told me, Brian, he said, the, the greatest decision ever made was following Christ. And now the next best thing you can do for yourself is be wise with who you marry. Right? And that's important, because they're either going to be the ones who push you towards Christ, or are going to be the ones that pull you away from Christ. They're either going to be, and I'm not saying that God can't work 
in a matter that's unequally yoked. But no doubt it can be hindering. You know, God has called us to be equally yoked with the one whom we marry. So that's an important decision. And then he goes on to talk about worship. I mean, who do you worship this evening? Who do you bow your hearts before? Do you serve Jesus? And is Je yes, he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. But, but, but that's, that's a challenging one for some people. Because is Jesus your Lord and Savior, or is he just your Savior, and he's just fire insurance to save you from burning in hell? Right? Either Jesus is all in your life, or he's not at all in your life. He needs to be Lord of all in your life, or he's not the Lord at all in your life. You know, you can't use the words no and Lord in the same sentence. And you know, men, we all have a little Isaac in us. We all have a little Jacob in us. We, we love to be rebellious. And ladies, you all have a little Rebecca in you. And those, those times where you, you're saying, oh, well, God, today you're my Savior, but you're not my Lord. I'm going I'm to completely ignore you, and I'm going to do my own thing. But guys, if, we've been, if we haven't learned anything these last few weeks through Genesis, is that when we take matters into our own hands, there's consequences. They try to do God's will with, with, with carnal motions. And, and there's the consequence. Uh, I, uh, Rebecca's never going to see her son Jacob again. This mother's never going to see her son again, and this son's never going to see his mother again. He's forced to flee because they tried to do uh, something spiritual in a carnal way. And so now as we go forward into verse 6, it says, Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him away to Padan Aram to take himself a wife from there, and that as he blessed him, he gave him a charge, saying, You shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. And that Jacob had obeyed his father and his mother and had gone to Padan Aram. And so here is Esau. He's observing his brother Jacob and how he's being obedient to his parents. And then you get into verse 8. That this, is, this is Esau's reaction. It says, also Esau saw the daughters of Canaan, excuse me, did not please his father Isaac. So Esau went to Ishmael and took Mahalath, the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son the sister of the, uh, Nebajoth, to be his wife, a lovely name, in addition to the wives he had. So there, there's one of two ways to look at this scenario, right? Either, either Esau is thinking, for one, okay, dad wants us to marry into the family, so I'm going to marry Uncle Ishmael's daughter. Because may, maybe he is so distraught over the fact that his former wives displeased his father that now he's striving and seeking and desiring to try to please his father. And he's like, okay, well, I'm going to marry into the family. I'm going uh, to marry Uncle Ishmael's daughter. And if that's the case, I mean, that just goes to show the impact that a father has in his, in, in, in his children's lives. That the, 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 the opinion of a father is so powerful. And God only knows. God only knows the suffering that's going on in this culture and this generation due to failing fathers. But God also only knows the blessings and the benefits that are going on in this generation due to successful parenting and successful fatherhood. And so this could be the scenario. Maybe he, he's seeking to please his father. Or maybe it's the other way around. Maybe Esau is not trying to please his father, but, he's, but because he despises his father now, he wants to inflict pain. And maybe he's thinking, okay, uh, you want to go send Jacob to Uncle Laban's house? Great. Well, I'm going to go to Uncle Ishmael's house now. Oh, yeah, Dad, you remember that brother that used to hate you and persecute you? Yeah, I'm going to go to him and I'm going to marry his daughter. If that's truly the case, then that just goes to show us the heart of Esau. That there's always been corruption in his heart all along. It, it's always been there, but it was just a matter of, of something drawing it out. And I believe that's the way it always is with these people, with people, right? People can, can deceive you their entire lives, but the moment that they don't get what they want, you see corruption unfold. They can be buddy-buddy with you for years. But the moment you don't align yourself with their agenda, you truly see where their heart's at. And you say, yikes. I'm so glad I didn't do business with that guy. This would have got messy. And this is such as Esau's life right now. You know, if this blessing was bestowed upon Esau... I mean, he would have squandered it. He would have wasted it. The corruption was always there. I don't think, you know, just because he's trying to hurt his father, that's the only reason he wants to go out and marry heathen women. I think he would have done that regardless if he got the blessing or not. Because, again, his heart has been carnal all along. And there's corruption. Esau was going to do what Esau wanted to do. Regardless of what anyone did, no matter if he got his way or not. And now it goes on to tell us in verse 10, we're going to begin to see... Uh, the, the journey. I've a review, you fly. Um, we're going to see the journey. 
of Jacob. In verse 10, it says, Now Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. This is a 450-mile journey. And so he came to a certain place and stayed there all night, because the sun had set, and took one of the stones of that place and put it at his head as a pillow. That's really uncomfortable. And he lay down in that place to sleep. Then he dreamed, and behold, a ladder was set up on the earth, and its top reached to heaven, and there were angels of God ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, of, uh, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac, the land of which you lie, I will give to you and your descendants. Also your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in you, and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Behold, I am with you, and I will keep you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. So here's Jacob again on this 450-mile journey, and he's not going to Haran because he's just trying to find a godly wife. He's also going on this journey because he's trying to escape uh, Esau from killing him. You know, at this point in time, his shoulders are heavy laden. He has a lot on his plate. I'm sure every noise he hears when he's in the wilderness, he's looking over his shoulder thinking it's Esau. Because Esau was a, was a skilled bow hunter. And he's probably waiting for him just to get stuck with his arrow. Every time he heard a noise, well, what's going on? I mean, not only that, but he has the pressure of his parents breathing down his neck saying, son, you need to get married, you need to get married, you need to get married. And so this is the first time he's been alone, and, and he's tired, and he's been, you know, cut off from his family. And so all the ingredients are here for a good night's rest. And so he, he goes to sleep. And what happens? He has the first encounter ever with the living God. You know, his grandfather Abraham experienced this. His father Isaac experienced this. And now he gets to experience this. You know, El Shaddai is no longer just this precept that's being passed down to him as a part of his heritage. No, it now becomes reality, becomes an experience, becomes truth. Because God's a personal God, and God just spoke to him. He's saying, whoa. And at this point, he's now a believer. And God shows him this dream, and, and there's a ladder, and there's angels ascending and descending upon it. And God speaks to him the blessings that he formerly spoke to his grandfather Abraham and his father Isaac. Now, many people in the church like to call this portion of Scripture Jacob's Ladder. And the word ladder in the Bible is only used once. It's a very unique word, and it literally means stairway. And is this what Led Zeppelin was thinking of when they wrote Stairway to Heaven? I don't know, perhaps. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but, you know, he sees this ladder, the stairway, and there's angels ascending and descending upon it. And what's interesting about this is if you were to go to John chapter 1, when Jesus is assembling his disciples, you know, first he, he pours, uh, he, he asks, um, uh, it's Philip to follow him. And then Philip goes to his friend Nathaniel. And he says, Nathaniel, we found the Messiah of Nazareth. And what, what does Nathaniel say? He says, can, can, can anything good come of Nazareth? And he says, okay, come and see. And he goes out to bring uh, Nathaniel to Jesus. And it tells us in John chapter 1, I'm going to pick up in verse, let's say, 47, that Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, and he said to him, Behold, in Israel indeed, in whom is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered and said to him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered and said to him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. So Jesus answered and said to him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than me. And he said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, hereafter you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. You know, no doubt after Jesus called his disciples, they got to see miracle after miracle after miracle. And here's Jesus speaking to Nathaniel saying, Listen, the angels are descending and de are ascending and descending, and, and this is just the beginning. You're going to see greater things. He's saying, listen, I, I am the exclusive way to heaven. I am the ladder. I am the bridge that bridge the gap between sinful man and holy God. That I am the only name under heaven in which you can be saved. There's no other name greater than mine. He says, I am the ladder. I am the bridge. I am the redeemer. I'm the mediator. I'm the go-between. I am the stairway. Right? I am the door. I am the pathway unto glory. 
And he's bringing this all before us. He, the ladder that Jacob saw was a way of access to God. And now Jesus, right, he's our way of access to God. So we have this whole typology going on here. And this is an extraordinary portion of Scripture, guys. Because Jacob is so human, he makes no apology for it. He's weak. He's frail. He's very flawed. Yet God, in his great faithfulness and his great love, reaches down to him, touches him, and changes his life. And he gives Jacob something he doesn't deserve. He gives him grace. Amen. Amen. And he gives him this dream. And he has little understanding of what this dream even means. He has no idea that it's pointing to this future fulfillment of Christ. But he clearly hears God speak. And he gives him this amazing promise, especially in verse 15. You know, he says again, behold, I am with you. Who else says that? Jesus, right? Jesus says that in the gospel. He says, behold, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. And he says, I will keep you wherever you go. And you can see that in the gospels too. With Peter, he was a man that blew it and dropped the ball time after time. But Jesus restored him. And he ended up being uh, one of the first church leaders in the book of Acts. And he preached the first sermon. I mean, God restored him. God was able to keep Peter, even though he's a knucklehead. And he will bring you back to this land. And that makes me think of Jesus who says, right, uh, i got to go right now. And i got to go and prepare a place for you, right, so that where I am, you may be also. And then he goes on to say, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. That is, uh, that is an amazing word, an amazing promise for the Lord. And this is something we should hold on to. Uh, he says, Behold, I am with you. I will keep you wherever you go. I will bring you back to this land, and I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. You know, instead of God stooping down and, and, and said, You scoundrel! I mean, you deceived your old blind dad. You deserve nothing from me. I ought to come down from this staircase and whoop you. He doesn't, no, he doesn't, God doesn't even mention a failure. God doesn't even rebuke him. Rather, he reaches out with grace and with love. And that's huge. That, that's such a blessing because he, that means that even in our perfections, Jesus is still with us. Because this covenant and the covenant we live under and under the blood of Christ is not based upon our performance, but it's based upon grace and covenant. And so he, it doesn't matter how bad and how deceptive Jacob was. He's pouring out grace. He's pouring out love. And so Jesus, he, he, no, no matter how ridiculous we are, he says, I'm going to be with you. And I'll keep you wherever you go. When you leave here and go off doing your own thing, I'm, I'm going to keep you. And he says, and I will bring you back to this land. Every time you backslide, every time you leave the fold, I have to go out for the one. I have to leave the 99 for you. I'm going to bring you back. And then he says, and I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. And if God has spoken a promise to you, he's not going to leave you until he fulfills that promise in your life. And so we go, the scriptures go on to say in verse 16, Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, surely, surely the Lord is in this place and I did not know it. So, you know, he, he's thinking, man, I was just in the middle of nowhere. I just put my head on a rock. Who would have thought that God would be here? Who would have, I never thought that God would speak to me here. Have you ever said that before? Right? Maybe you, you tried out a new church, or you go do something, and you're like, this place is wacko, this place is ridiculous. God would never choose to speak to me here. And then out of nowhere, when you least expect it, boom! <laughs> Lord! Wow! He just speaks to you. And he, he, he breaks through the chaos, he breaks through the walls, and he still has something extraordinary to speak into your life. You know, it makes me think of the two disciples on the road to Emmaus after the crucifixion. You know, they're troubled in their heart, and they're grieved in their heart. It's heavy, and they're walking. Oh, Jesus is dead. Jesus is dead. And when they least expect it, here appears Jesus, and he walks with them on the road. <laughs> what about in the book of Acts when, the, when Paul the Apostle is on the ship, and it's going down, and everyone lost hope of Paul saying, Guys, I know this looks terrible right now, but it's going to be okay. Jesus appeared to me, and he says, We're going to get through this. He's here. He's alive. Oh, what about the disciples on the sea? When they're caught in the storm and they're crying out of fear from drowning. When they least expect it, here comes Jesus. Just walking on the water. I'm here. What about, you know, when God calls Noah into the ark? Noah walks into the ark and guess who's there? God. What about Elijah? 
But Elijah flees out of fear, and he goes into a cave. And when he gets into the cave, what happens? God says, what are you doing here? God was there. God was in the cave. There is nowhere you can go to get away from God. He's always with you. And God will come through in many ways. God's going to come through in many ways in your lives. Maybe it's going to be tonight going through his word. Or maybe in the morning when you open up the Bible, he's going to speak to you through his word. Maybe he's going to put a strong impression upon your heart. Or maybe he's going to send one, someone on his behalf to, to rescue you. I don't know. However God wants to do it, he's going to do it. He's going to do it. He's going to reach you. Do you know where you are tonight? What place are you in tonight? The Lord is here. Do you recognize him? Jesus is here. And if you don't recognize I'm here to tell you he's still here. Because his word tells us, I am with you always. And I will never leave you. And I will never forsake you. And we can all know that verse and we can remember it and know all these things. But it's a whole different ballgame to believe it. And to embrace it. And to hold on to it with faith, with all that you have. And so it goes on to say in verse 17, And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place? And you know, recently I was just on my mission trip in Africa, and I was with my, my missionary pastor, Chuck Springer. And I always say the word awesome in reference to everything. And he goes, You know, Brian, the only time I ever use the word awesome is in reference to God. And I said, Wow, Chuck, you know what? That's awesome. You're right, that's awesome. <laughs> but he says, how awesome is this place? I lost my Okay, this is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. So as he's in this dream, right, and he sees this ladder with all the action on it, he goes, surely this is the gate. Right, he recognizes what's going on, he recognizes what's before him, where he's at, and he says, this is it. And it's awesome. It's awesome. And he, he's thinking, this is no coincidence. This is no accident. I just didn't mistakenly stumble uh, upon this certain place, the Bible says, this obscure place. I didn't just stumble upon it by accident. and happened to lay my head on this, on this rock that happened to be this portal to heaven. This, this doesn't happen. There was something about this dream that was divine, that was heavenly. He knew it was of God. Has that ever happened to you? Yes. yes. Yeah. Right? I've had a few dreams in my life where I wake up and I say, whoa. Surely that was God. <laughs> this Amen. is the kind of dream that, that Jacob just had. He's mind blown. Uh, now it goes on to tell us in verse 18. It says, Then Jacob rose early in the morning. Right? No hesitation. God just did something amazing. He gets up early in the morning. I'm going for it. And he, and he took the stone that he had put on his head, uh, put at his head. And he set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. And he called the name of the place Bethel, which literally means house of God, right? Beth, house of El, God, uh, house of God. But the name of the city had been Luz previously. And so, you know, he, he takes this pillow that he had, it was a rock, and then he removes it. And God just did something amazing through that rock, apparently, when he dreamt. And, and he sets it up a, a, as a beacon, as a pillar, as a monument, as a memorial, as a remembrance. And all throughout scripture, men of God would do this. If you're familiar with the book of Joshua, when Joshua's leading the children of Israel into the land of Canaan, which is the promised land, he has to go over the Jordan River, and God stops the waters. And as they're cutting over it, uh, Joshua takes 12 stones, which represented the 12 tribes of Israel, but it was a memorial, and he places it in the middle of the Jordan River. And then when he gets to the other side, he takes another 12, and he sets them up. And again, it was just to remind him and the people throughout history, this is what God did. God did this. God's the one that brought us from, from, from nowhere, from, from Egypt slavery, into the promised land. God is so faithful, and he, and he sets these things up. Now, we're going to um, begin to close out here. I know this was kind of a short chapter, but it was jam-packed. Um, and, and chapter 29 is way too long. So listen, uh, we're going to close here. And Robbie and Neil, if you want to come up for the last song, All right. um, we're, we're uh, just begin to set up. And let's finish this off. So it tells us in verse 20. It said, Then Jacob made a vow, which means a deal. And this part's really humorous to me because Jacob is a man that's known for making deals. And you think after this dream, this encounter with God, he would have straightened out, but instead he, he chose not to, and he tries to strike a deal with God. So it says that Jacob tries to make a vow. He said, he said If God will be with me, 
and keep me in the way that I am going. And give me bread to eat and, put, uh, and clothing to put on so that I come back to my father's house in peace. Then, then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone, which I have set as a pillar, shall become God's house. And of all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. So again, Jacob is a man who's known for making deals. He made a deal with Esau, and he stole the birthright. He made a, he made a deal with his mom to deceive his father. And now he's trying to strike a deal with God. He says, ah, God, I have a proposition for you. You know, I, I saw the gate. I saw the ladder. I saw the angels. That was pretty cool. What about this, God? If you bring me back to this place, my father's place, peacefully. Oh, which, by the way, I'm going to need clothing and I'm going to need food. If you do that, God, then you'll become my God. Oh, and by the way, I'll also give you a tenth of everything that you give me. How about that? Does that sound good to you, God? Is that a great deal or what? And I'm sure the Trinity in heaven just chuckled. <laughs> You're nothing. You know, as we go throughout the book of Genesis, looking at the life of Jacob, you know what God's going to do? God's going to break this man. God's going to humble this man. Amen. God is going to deal with him and make him into the man he is supposed to be. Again, he, he's been a deceiver his entire life. And guess what? Where is he going? He's going to Uncle Laban's house. And when he gets to Haran, he's finally going to meet his match. He's going to realize that deceivers run in the family. And he's going to find out that Uncle Laban is twice as bad as him. And he's going to be broken. He's going to be humbled. And listen, being broken by the Lord and being humbled by the Lord, it's good. It doesn't feel good, but it's good. And the purpose to it and the intentions of it are always much greater and better than we would think. You know, oftentimes we, we approach God and we say, Ah, oh, God, I have this brilliant idea. Uh, idea. This is what I want to do. This is my plan. Watch this, God. And, and there's so much of us involved that, that God just doesn't even receive an ounce of the glory. And so what does God do? He interjects himself. And he breaks you. He humbles you. He empties you out of yourself and shows you your severe need for him. That if anything does get accomplished, he gets the glory. Not you. You see, God is not in the business of making deals. He's in the business of making people. Yes. Amen. He just wants to break us, and he has these amazing tools to humble us because we are proud creatures. We think we can do so much without him. And we think our plans are always better than God's plans. So again, as we go forward, we're going to see that, that Jacob, he has a lot of work ahead of him. A lot to handle. I mean, again, he, he, he tried to help God out by, this, by uh, stealing the birthright. He tried to help God out by deceiving his father. And now he's trying to come to God on his own terms. He says, Lord... If you do this, then I'll follow you. How many people are like that today? Oh, Lord, uh, once I have this amazing job and a career, then I'll follow you. Lord, once I get enough sleep, then I'll follow you. Lord, once I get you know, my finances situation, this gets better and that gets better, then I will follow you. Once I get the vehicle, then I'll follow you. Once I get married, then you know, there's always one thing after the other, then I'll follow you. And if that's our plan, listen, God's going to interrupt that plan. God's not going to align himself with your plan. He's going to break down your plan. He's going to break you to put you in a position to serve him. <laughs> Sing me first. And if anyone has been walking with the Lord long enough, and has anyone's ever been in ministry, I'm sure you know a thing or three about this, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> But I, I want to close with this. This is the word I want to leave you with. Brokenness proceeds usefulness. Yes. Brokenness proceeds usefulness. God must break us that he may use us. And so we'll get into Genesis chapter 29 next time. Father, we do just thank you for your word. We thank you for the book of Genesis, Lord. And just looking at these patriarchs that you have appointed so long ago. And Lord, just seeing their flaws, seeing their imperfections, seeing that their knuckleheads just like us sitting here tonight. Lord, that we can relate. Like we can overly relate. And we thank you for having a book that's so open and so transparent and so honest. Yes. That, Lord, that you don't set some standard that's impossible for us to hold. But yet we say, yeah, I get that. But, Lord, how do we fix that? And you reveal to us what to do. And you allow us to learn from other people's mistakes. And you allow us to follow the example 
that this great people of faith left, that we may inherit the promises that you have ordained, and that you have spoken, and that you have given to us. And so, Lord, I pray that we can push every hindrance aside to step into those blessings that you've bestowed upon us, and that you want to give us, Lord. And so, God, would you just be with us as we go out of here tonight? And, Lord, we do want to just worship you with one last song. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 prayer to I can continue lifting up my dad. Okay. Still in a coma. Lifting up Joseph. Continue lifting up my sister. Okay. And Rhonda's son Paul. Okay. Paul. And what's your sister's name? And you can stop that too if you want. Lisa. Uh, what is it? Lisa. Okay. 